Good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to another session of the Truth Enlighten. I happy Sabbath to everyone and I uh, trust that God has been good to you as you or you recognize God's goodness to you since the last time we have met and um, you're in some mind and healthy body. All right. Um, this week we have uh, our introduction would be to the book of uh, would be to the book of Jude. Introducing the book of Jude this week, and our main lesson is what uh, the the what is what is the biblical solution to evil and the sin problem? All right, so that's a very interesting one, and I trust that uh, you stick around to know what that means. And I encourage you to share the, the live, share the video, and so that somebody else may be blessed. I, and uh, don't forget the YouTube channel. Go over there and there you can see past videos. It's like and subscribe. All right. Um, may God continue to be with us as we continue to dive into his word and to know more of him and so that we can better please him all right so we'll be looking at the this week we'll be introducing the book i'll be introducing the book of jude few books in the new testament have more to say uh, to our generation than the epistle of jude the starters of the faith will find the book of uh, the book distasteful because it's of its warning and uncompromising stance against defectors from the truth of Jesus Christ. But to those who approach the book with receptive arts, Jude's words speak as clearly and forcefully today as they did almost 2,000 years ago. The small epistle strikes the imagination with its vivid picture of false teachers. The writer commands our attention with his appeals for defending the faith and growing in grace. The primary focus of the book is on faith, is on the faith, the, be, the believers and God, not on the, on the errors and characters of the heretics. It is notable that with all of the blunt, uh, the blunt description of the false teachers, Jude gives us neither a command to, co to confront these troublemakers only to avoid them, nor a plan of disciplinary action did he give us. He simply indicates they are under the commendation of God. The author of this epistle calls himself Jude, and there is no reason to think that this is a so the <clears throat> A pseudonym. There are six individuals named Jude in the New Testament, but only two are likely to have written this book. One, the Apostle Jude, see Luke 6:16 6, and Acts 1:13, who is probably Thaddeus of Matthew chapter 10, verses 3. Secondly, Jude, the brother of James and the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. The brothers of the Lord are named in Matthew 13, 55, as ja the brothers of, this is brothers, James, 
Jose, Simon, Simon, and Judas. Since the author does not claim apostolic authority, and since verse 17 indicates that the apostles are a group that does not include the writer, we are left with the second candidate, Jude, the brother of the Lord, and of James. This identification is confirmed by the author's reference to his brother James in verse 1, and a reference in a letter of Clement of Alexandria around A.D. 153 to 217. We might wonder, or we might wonder why Jude did not assert that he was the brother of the Lord Jesus, but his first readers would already have known this. Also, even in the year following the resurrection, there were already some superstitions surrounding the Holy Family that Jude might have wished to avoid. Although assigning an exact date for the writing of Jude is impossible, it is likely that the book was written between AD 60 to 64. It was almost certainly written before AD 70, since Jude does not make any reference to the fall of Jerusalem that year. If, he had been if it had been written after that event, he would have doubtless have mentioned it, since it would have severe, since it would serve as an example of God's judgment. The obvious similarities between Jude and 2 Peter, 2 Peter 2, seems to show that one has borrowed from the other. The, vo the vocabulary of the two books is similar to both books as the Old Testament for illustrations, and neither quotes it directly. The books deal with similar situations, though their approaches are different. Peter seems to be anticipating difficulty with false teachers. The future, the future tense is used in Second Peter chapter two, verses one, two, three, while Jude uses the past tense to describe the situation in verses four. On the other hand, because of the more precise language in, in Jude, many scholars believe that Jude was first and Peter borrowed from him. But this cannot be known for certain. The literary from, from Jude is the common style of correspondence of that day. The letter opened with the author name, description of the recipient, and a, conve a conventional wish that they are well. Yet, as with other New Testament epistles, the eloquence and the depth of thought rises far above the usual business and personal correspondence. Jude, come quick, Jude comes quickly to his point, not, con, not content merely to expose error for forcefully ex, exhorts his readers and concludes with an eloquent benediction. From his opinion, from his opening sentence, the author ass assaults error, threatens judgment, and encourages holiness. The description of the errors of the false teachers is poetic 
in its emerge imagery in verses 12 and 13. Jude likely to arrange Jude likes to arrange his thoughts in groups of three. In verse 1, Christians are called sanctified and preserved. In verse 2, the author wishes for his readers mercy, peace, and love. In verses 5 through 7, there are three illustrations of sin and judgment from the Old Testament. In verses 8, in verse 8, the false teachers are described as defiling the flesh, rejecting authority, and speaking evil of dignitaries. In verse 11, three examples of rebellion, Cain, Balaam, and Korah, are given. All of this persuasive prose result in a strong encouragement to the faithful to contend earnestly for the faith in verse 3. That brings us to the end of the introduction to the book of Jude. And now we'll take <clears throat> go into the lesson for the day. Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. May God continue to bless you and keep you guys. What is the biblical solution to the problem of evil and sin? Everybody wants to know if there is a solution to the evil that is uh, around us and going on in this world. So let's see what the Bible says. But broadly stated, the problem of evil is seeming con contradiction between an all-powerful, all-loving God and the human experience of suffering and evil in the world. Critics claim that the existence of evil is proof that the omnipotent, omni, omnivalent, omnivalent God of the Bible cannot exist. Since bad things happen to good people, critics say God is either, either non-existent are less good or less powerful than scripture suggested. Despite what some critics think, the so-called problem of evil is not nothing the Bible leaves unaddressed. Scripture not only refers to the problem of evil, but it offers several solutions to it. By looking at the, uh, the Bible's honest questioning of evil, God's response to evil, and the scriptural solution to evil, one can address this problem using almost nothing other than God's Word. Of course, this question ties into theology and philosophy as well. There are multiple ways of coming to possible solutions, and none is entirely complete all by itself. According to the Bible, the experience of evil is something God understands and acknowledges. God's willingness to grant us the freedom of making our own choices also allows for the possibility of moral evil. Moral evil leads to physical evil. Even so, God has always acted to, so to soften the blows that evil and suffering lands on humanity. He also provided the one and only means to make all wrongs right. 
One day, God's plan to defeat and destroy evil will be fully complete. Now, Scripture acknowledges the problem of evil. Many of the Bible's 66 individual books openly express what we would now term the problem of evil. In some cases, these expressions are all but a direct accusation against God. In response to the suffering the writers had seen or experienced. The entire book of Job, for example, is a discussion of the reasons why mankind experiences suffering even when we don't seem to deserve it. In addition, Scripture offered many other notable passages that clearly reflects the problem of evil. Abacuc, Abacuc uh, chapter 1 verses 2 through 4 says, how long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but, but, you, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice or injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is a, there is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked and in the righteous so that justice is perverted. This is men of the word crying out to God when going through situations. Ecclesiastes 4, chapter 1, verses 3. Again, I looked and saw all the oppressed that was taking place on, all the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of their oppressor. And they have no comforter, and I declare that the dead who had already died are happier than the living, who are still alive. But better than both is the one who has never been born, who has not seen the evil that is done under the sun. This is Solomon. Mm -hmm. Psalms 10.1 Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble. Psalms 22 verses 1 to 2. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. My God, I cry but by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Psalms 83 verses 1 through, one, one through 2. O God, do not remain silent. Do not turn a deaf ear. Do not stand aloof, O God. See how your enemies growl, how your foes fear, how your foes rear their heads. John 16, 2 through 4. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such thing because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this, so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. Romans chapter 8 verses 36, As it is written, For your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered a sheep to be slaughtered. Revelation chapter 6 verses 9 through 10. 
When he opened the, the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, and the testimony of they, uh, of they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? These passages show a personal deep awareness of the reality of evil. Scripture does not present evil as an abstraction or a remote idea. The real human being who recorded the words of the Bible were painfully aware of the existence of evil and suffering, and they were willing to express their feeling to God, especially when they felt he wasn't acting according to their expectation. Notably, however, these same authors also recognize and trust the goodness of God to make these, these wrongs right someday. Now, Scripture frames the problem of evil. The Bible makes it clear that evil is something God neither intended nor created. Rather, moral evil is a necessary possibility. If we are truly free, then we are free to choose something other than God's will. That is, we can choose moral evil. Scripture points out that there are consequences for denying the will of God, personal, communal, physical, and spiritual. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1, God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 through 17, and the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19 to Aram, he said, Because you listened to your wife and had fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Curse is the ground because of you. Through pain, full toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and all will eat the plant, and you will eat the plant of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return." Proverbs chapter 14, verses 34. Righteousness exalted a nation, but sin condemns any people. Proverbs chapter 19, verses 3. A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Their own folly, but yet their heart rages against the Lord. Matthew 5, 3 to 11. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those the meek. For they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who are, pre are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. John 9, 1 through 13 says, As... He went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 28, it says, wrath of, the, wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the goodness of the wickedness of the godly, godlessness of the wickedness of people who suppress the truth 
by their wickedness, since that may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Just as they did not think it worthwhile to, re to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Romans chapter 3 verses 23 For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5 12 Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin and in this way death came to all people because all sin. Hebrews 2, 2, 2 3 says, For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? Taken together, Scripture shows us that physical evils Sickness, famine, war, and death are the result of moral evil. And moral evil is something human beings are all responsible for. On a personal and communal com uh, com level, we suffer because of our own sins at times. Other times, we suffer because of the sins of others. In some situations, we suffer because from simple causes and effects. And we sometimes suffer for a special purpose in order to bring hope or help or a warning to others. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4. The Bible frames problems of evils by keeping it in the proper context. Evil is meaningless without something to compare it to. For comparison, we have the original create, creation of God called very good. Genesis chapter 1 verses 31. We have the standard of goodness in God himself and we have an explanation for the various causes of evil and suffering. Likewise, we see that this physical world is not all there is, nor is this more mortal life all we have been made for. We can experience physical struggles such as mourning, and persecution, Matthew chapter 5, verses 4 and 11, while looking to a greater, more permanent state of being blessed. Of course, clearly framing what evil is and why we experience it is not the same as resolving the problem of evil. However, even the framing of evil in the context of Christian theology shows that our experience of evil and suffering is not incompatible with God's existence. Amplifying this proof is how the Bible goes beyond accurately describing evil to revealing God's action to remedy it. <clears throat> Now, Scripture opposes the problem of evil. Scripture shows that God did not create evil 
and does not promote it. Rather, it describes God's action in combating it. God limits the impact of evil, warns us of the dangers of evil, acts to stop the spread of evil, gives us an escape from evil, and will eventually defeat evil forever. Genesis chapter 3 verses 21, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and Eve, for Adam and Eve, or Eve his wife, and clothed them. Genesis chapter 4 verses 10 through 15, The Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother, your brother's blood from your hand. When you work, when you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be restless. You will be a restless wanderer on the herd. Cain said to the Lord. My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be restless, will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But God the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance, even he will suffer vengeance seven times over. In Genesis chapter 5 verses, Genesis chapter 6 verses 5 to 8, the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thought of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them, the animals, the birds, the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. In Genesis chapter 7 verses 1 to 4 it says, the Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And in Deuteronomy chapter 9, it is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going to take possession of their land. But on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 15 through 18 says, See, I set there before you, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to Him, and to keep His commandments, decrees and decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you're, you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. Like the Lord is saying today, you will not live long in this land that you are possessing if you remain disobedient to Him. In Jonah chapter 3 verses 6 through 10, it says, When Jonah warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne. 
took off his royal robes, and now listen to this very carefully, right? This this um, particular reading, Jonah chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Now Jonah was sent to Nineveh, and we know the story where Jonah rebelled. He didn't want to go to Nineveh because the men there, or the people there, were very heartless, right? And he think that God should not save them. So he did his own thing and he was swallowed. We know the story. And he was um, swallowed by the big fish, right? Or the whale. Now he went into Nineveh and he, he ministered to, this, to the king. And this hard-hearted people that he think was so hard-hearted, right? Here is what happens in Jonah chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. When Jonah warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, he the king, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he stood in Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened right and many of us sometimes we read the word of God and we say the people back then was very hard hearted if we were living back then what we would have done and what we wouldn't have done but they did not have these examples they didn't have these examples like we have. So who is more hard-hearted today? Right? Matthew ten twenty eight. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Matthew 23, verses 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathereth or chick or chicks under our wings, and you were not willing. In First Corinthians chapter six, verses nine through eleven. Or do you know? Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither. Neither the sexually immoral, nor I, I, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor women who have sex with women, I put, I put in there, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the slanderers, nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Colossians chapter 1 verses 13, For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of, of the Son, he loves. Second Thessalonians chapter two seven. For the secret power of the lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Second Peter chapter two verses nine says, "The Lord knows." out to rescue the godly 
from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. All right, so <clears throat> Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, so whose rider is called faithful and true. With justice he judged and waged and wages war. In Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 15, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the book. Each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire, the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. We're looking at the solution to the sin problem or solution to evil. And how the Bible is going to deal, how the Bible say God is going to deal with it. Share the life and, you know, encourage others to, so that they can be saved. You know, a day is coming, the day is sure to come. In Revelation 21 verses 1 through 5 it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. The Bible explains that God has acted to limit the impact of evil. He has given us clear instructions to avoid being evil. God has also made spiritual power available to those who want to be freed from the power of evil. And from the very beginning, God set in motion a plan to make all wrongs right and our experience of evil and suffering. See Genesis chapter 3 verses 15. Now, like I always encourage you to ask your questions and you can make comments if you so choose, right? The scripture reveals the sin problem. <clears throat> Our scripture reveals... Yes, yeah, scripture resolves the problem of evil. Let's see how it does it. The existence of evil is often represented as an enormous problem for those who believe in God. Mostly because of various false... Uh, Dichotomies, dichotomies. God must. It is assumed, disallowed, uh, disallow all evil, or he is evil himself. God must immediately punish all evildoers and never trouble those who are innocent. Now, the last week we learned that there is nobody innocent, right? So we see what we learned then, what would happen if God decide to eliminate the sin problem by striking people down, then the whole, everyone would be stricken dead. 
or he is assumed or he is assumed not to be omnipotent. In reality, these assumptions miss the actual means by which scripture resolves the problem of evil. As we have seen, the Bible acknowledges evil, correctly frames it, and shows how God opposes it. Most importantly though, scriptures explain how the existence of the Christian God defeats the problem of evil. In Matthew chapter 16 verses 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day may third day be raised to life. In Mark chapter 10 verses 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. In Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 20, it says, And he, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body give, given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. John chapter 14, verses 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In John chapter 19, verses 16 through 18 said, Finally, Pilate handed him over to them, to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which is called in Aramaic, is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with, and with him two others, one, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. In John chapter 19, verses 30, it says, It is finished. He said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In John chapter 20, verses 19 through 20, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and said, and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. In John chapter 2, in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1, it says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built, by human hands. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to em empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. In 1 John chapter 3 verses 1 it says, See, what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 through 22. Once you were alienated, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, 
but now he has reconciled you by Christ physically physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation rather than creating us as robots or dooming mankind for our sins or condemning our sins by leaving it unresolved God choose the one and only way to settle the problem. He created us with the freedom to choose our actions and then extended forgiveness to us. Forgiveness is the Christian answer to the problem of evil. I repeat that. Forgiveness is the Christian answer to the problem of evil. So if we want to have a prob the problem of evil solved, if we want to have evil eradicated, right, we have to go to God seeking forgiveness. Forgiveness is different from condemnation. It releases the condemned from punishment. Forgiveness is also different from excusing evil. It, it, it acknowledge that there is wrong to be made right. The basis of our forgiveness, the cross is the intersection of God's perfect moral character, which is love and omnipotence. Since he chose to take our penalty upon himself, all suffering and evil can be overcome. According to the Bible, the evil we experience in this life has already been defeated and everyone has access to that victory. To God be the glory. Right? This is where we leap into here to the here and jump for joy. John chapter 3 verses 16 through 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son in the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stand condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the, of God, the one and only one, one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does not who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. In John chapter 16, verses 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So if he has overcome the world and we are in him, we are overcomers of the world. Ends the talk that the peace that passeth all understanding. So many may look and see that we are enjoying a life in Christ, but can understand how and why. Right? Because we have that peace that passes all understanding. The understanding of my man cannot understand how among all these atrocities we can still be joyful in the Lord. We can because we are in Him. Taken as a whole, as it is intended, the Bible describes evil as something God allowed, but never condemned 
for the sake of our free will. Although history, all through history, God, uh, God has taken step to limit the influence of evil. And most importantly, God himself took the consequences of our sin. So every person can have access to forgiveness and salvation. As a result, all sin, evil, and suffering will someday be completely ended. Beyond the philosophical and theological aspects of this issue, Scripture in and of itself goes a long way to naturalizing the power of the problem of evil. All right, so I trust that we be able to, we were able to understand that even though evil exists in the world today, it is not without solution. God has a, 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 a set up a, a system whereby we can, we can ride above the evils of this world and one day right, be free from it when, he's, when he comes, you know. But the reason why many people do not uh, come to the light, the reason many people choose not to come to the light is because they are afraid of the revelation. What light does, light reveals what is happening. You know, like let's say you enter into a dark room, you will not know what obstacles are in the room until you put on the light. When you switch on the light, then there's a revelation of what is going on in the room, right? So now you know how to step, where to walk, and you know to find what you're looking for because the light has revealed that. So, when we come to Christ or we come before Him or we come in the presence of His words, like there's many people who are not going to, like I say constantly, many people would not choose to come on this po programs like this, right? Because it is true, right? It is um, shedding light on a sin, the sin problem. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and none of us is righteous. But Satan would want us to remain in darkness. So what he does to some of us, right, you'll never want to come to this point whereby you will have truth shared and light shown because you're afraid of what it would make, like taking for instance, some people want to continue in darkness, right? Want to continue in sin because it has a kind of sweetness to it while it lasts or while you're there in it. To come to the truth is to have your conscience worked on so that you can move from darkness to light but many want to enjoy and to double a little more in that sin so these are the kind of programs many people are not going to find joyful and if they come they want to be excited they want something to trigger that you know tickle their minds and you know you have somebody spitting up and carrying on and Catching, catching all kind of anta banter and carrying on, and that yes, and so it work on their feelings. But what that does, that only makes them feel temporarily. Um, it, it makes them feel good for a moment and excited, like you go to church and you want to have a pastor who would jump up and carry on and hoop and all, of. and so by so doing. Um, He's working on your emotion and you and you walk up there and you make an altar call and you gone up and then when he's finished and you gone home you feel good. But the next day you're back to your same old ways, you know. 
and goes on in uh, year in year out you know and never coming to an understanding of the truth and even moving in the direction that God wants you to move because you choose what you choose so that you'll feel how you feel and not really choosing the, 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 the truth right and it's only the truth will set you free according to the Bible so that's the reason some people um, you know doesn't want to come to the light because of the revelation you know their sins be revealed and they are afraid of their sins being revealed but God says Jesus says don't be afraid of those who can only kill the body right but be afraid of the one who can kill both body and soul in hell right so my thing is you know the message here is for us to you know I'm not gonna sit down here and mince words right the call is for us to come out of darkness and into his marvelous light and coming out of darkness and into his marvelous me light means leaving death moving from death to life you know and it is so serious that I don't care whether you come on the, on the live or not but if afterwards you watch and it's working you decide to act upon the words of God it's all about your soul salvation however you choose to be saved for God to save you then let it be right but please I beseech you to come move from darkness into the light and obtain salvation because Jesus is going to put an end to the sin problem very soon soon and very soon right and uh, like I said time and again if you think he's taking too long look at those who have gone on before look at those who died and who is dying even as we speak some don't have that opportunity to make a decision they're gone just wipe out you know Jesus has come for them he already come there is no repentance in the grave like some may try to may want you to believe there is no purgatory you're dead you're dead and gone and the next thing you'll know is you're being resurrected right but blessed are those who have part in the first resurrection for the second re resurrection is for the dead you don't want to be in the second res resurrection right but for those who choose to be there they will be resurrected for the judgment right so you don't want that we is out of love God loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever will believe on him may have everlasting life and all who love God and believe in him must love their neighbor to the extent to want to see them to come to the place where they are they are in Christ and they must want to bring others to Christ so that we all can be in Christ and to you know enjoy him and that place he is going to prepare for us so without any further you know thing I'll let you guys go but encouraging you to read your word and to continue believing in it don't only read it and don't only hear the word if you don't read but you're hearing it but be a doer of the word so that you can save your soul and when you have been saved and when you have become strong strengthen your brother as Jesus said to Peter all right so thank you very much for watching 
like I always encourage, ask your questions, and, um, you know, if there is comments anyone need to make, make it. Even after this, you know, you have any comments you want to comment on the video, you do so after it would have been posted. Go to YouTube. You too, my sister. Have a blessed night. Go to YouTube and um, see the, you know, the videos there. Uh, what you can do is like, subscribe, share, you know, and uh, so that others may have an opportunity to get the blessing you have received. You have, whoever here this fall on today, have been blessed. And whoever it will fall on will be blessed. And uh, don't be selfish. Share the blessing. Right? That is why I encourage you share the lives. You know, share the videos. Not for my sake. Again, not for my sake. If it was for my sake, I would not have been holding out to this, you know, point. You know. It all, it's all for your own salvation, for your sake, right? So I beseech you that you walk in the ways of the Lord, right? And thank you, Lord, and continue in his ways for your name, for his name's sake, all right? So may God bless you and keep you and may he cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace in your heart peace in your home peace on your job peace on the streets peace wherever you go may his peace be with you until he comes and receive you unto himself thank you